Yes. Adam, yeah. I'm sorry if I missed this, but yeah. how were the dogs and wolves raised? Well, uh, the, the dogs and wolves were raised in a way that you get a dog and a wolf puppy on the day before 10, so basically before eye opening. Then they were assigned to a student, or a student were assigned to a dog or the wolf. And then the task of this person was to have 24 hour contact with the animal for the first four months, which is a huge job, if, uh, so it's very uh, exhausting. And then uh, after this time, the dogs were, the wolves were so slowly sort of re reintegrated with a pack. However, they were still in a human contact because this pack lived in a, or is living actually in a farm situation where there were other do animals, dogs, and, uh, and so on. So they had regular human contact with the people. And then some of these, and then we tested some of the other experiments later that were raised in a similar way. Okay, I, that's my, my concern is actually if you want to demonstrate there's a genetic difference yeah. between dogs and wolves, that you have to have some kind of common garden that maybe goes on for you a few generations. And ideally, maybe even cross-fostering, where you have dogs raised by wolves and vice versa. Um, again, for a few generations to avoid like epigenetic effects and imprinting across generations. Have you considered a study design like that? Well, if you know a billionaire who would support that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. They're, they're the cheapest people. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean it's quite difficult. So especially um, the problem with the cross cross fostering. So so what is important that for all this experiment we have the humans there, which are who are the presenting the stimulus. And actually, what we want to show is that they're understanding the human communication. So the why the, the therefore because wolves are. Uh, so that is actually an idea at the moment that I think that wolves are very much focused on their own species. And that's one change in the genetic which uh, actually would be, could be important. So probably to have wolves cross fostered by dogs would not really help this thing because then they wouldn't perform in this experiment. So actually here what is important that, I mean, uh, I, can, uh, I can show you, if I cheating now, I maybe I show you a few uh, recording from the af afternoon session just to show you the wolves how they maybe some people are not coming um, that they are really very much dog like so here's a positive evidence for wolves uh, that are uh, oh, well, I'm not sure whether you can so here's a pointing experiment where humans are pointing and you can also see that the wolves are really much like a dog. I mean, he's, he's on a leash, you can walk with them, you can pull them back, they would eat, they would look at the human. So they do all of the, those sorts of dog-like things. The problem is that they show it this only if you, they are raised in a dominantly human environment. So if you, if you put them back to the wolves and they spend a lot of time, they are get frightened, they are running away, it's impossible to do experiments. So we have to balance here a little bit. Yeah, I'm not yeah. disputing the That's okay. it's just uh, differences, but uh, I'm just concerned, I guess, that there are some periods very early in development where um, humans or uh, dog parents impart a special ability to their offspring. Yes. And uh, perhaps wolves can be uh, receptive to that in the right situation. It's not really genetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, that's what I'm saying. So it's always a hey, place for the debate this here. This is the billionaire question again. Yeah. But have you considered generating hybrids between dogs and wolves and seeing if these traits segregate? Uh, no, <laughs> because I mean, yes. And I mean, if you are if you come with a genetic background, of course, we say yes. But uh, we haven't done it for the same reason. So so the other problem is that uh, man managing hybrids is more difficult than managing dogs and wolves together. Let's put it this way. So that's quite difficult, and I'm not sure how many animals you would need for an experiment. I mean, to have you account for variability and all that. So I mean, there's a whole community of people that are generating dog wolf hybrids. Yeah, in the United the States, people are working on that issue. Yes, I know. Yes, yes, and that's not very good. That so, so actually, and there are many other. So we don't want to contribute to more, do more, <laughs> but those wolf animals are not well controlled for other reasons. So it is very, very complicated. Yeah. So probably we have to. <laughs> Uh, use other methods. The other one method would be actually what I always say when you comp 
of course, we are doing this wolf and dog comparison because it's neat and interesting. But what I was saying that actually you have a very nice variation in between the dogs. So why not using that? So actually, if you have dogs that are sort of wolf-like, you have dogs that are sort of uh, dog-like, uh, more cooperative, and so on. So we might actually do something along that line, and, or including, and then you actually don't really need to this uh, problem of uh, human socialization because most dogs would be socialized anyway. So that would be, I think, an alternative way of. Another thing yeah. you could do is use feral populations of dogs, like uh, riot dogs, you know, that have yeah. been raised. In yes, I mean, so yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Yes, but. I, I was thinking along similar lines to what you just mentioned, but um, uh, rather than the wolf like versus dog like um, phenotypic distinctions, which, as I understand it, at least map on to some behavioral differences within dogs also, but uh, presumably there are, there are breed differences um, where. Breeds have been created specifically to be highly responsive to, to commands, so herding dogs, for yeah. example, right? Um, and uh, other breeds, perhaps the miniatures, where um, uh, A, they have no working responsibilities, and B, they're very easy to control by force, and so they don't need to be particularly trained. Um, perhaps some people in the room have experiences with dogs that are small and ill-trained. Um, uh, uh, and and <laughs> Brook, Brook not to name an exemplar of that. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie is exceptionally well directed. Um, uh, uh, but so you would expect that miniature breeds, for example, might show fewer of the pedagogical responsivity, for example, compared to um, uh, herding animals. And I mean, the cross fostering experiments that Bob suggested are very easy to do then, right? Because it's a simple matter to cross foster between breeds. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm very skeptical of that explanation, frankly, and I think that you will see breed differences um, uh, uh, that, that are robust and survive all the possible environmental differences. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree. So, so uh, I'm just smiling because when you say simple, you, you, people are coming from a laboratory background. So if you have black mice and white mice and you cross force them, that's no problem. If you want to talk to a breeder, you have a nice husky, do you want to have a Labrador puppies? You know, I mean, it, it, that's not so easy. But I understand, yes. Yeah, so biologically, I totally agree that that would be the way to go. But uh, I think even especially comparing wolves and dogs, it's, it's much better to compare breeds that probably are selected. We did actually, I, w I will tell you not everything now, so in the evening, <laughs> it was a, a few experiments where we really focused on breed differences and uh, show some variability along this line, including feral or, or not feral, mongrel dogs, sorry. Yeah, so. Thank you for a great talk, and I'm totally convinced. I, I did have a question, but now I want to um, respond to these, the, the line that these guys were taking. I don't think that their experiments, even if you were to do them, would show anything, and this is why. I mean, they'd show something, but they wouldn't show, they wouldn't show that it was genetic or not genetic. And this is because your whole thesis has to do with pedagogy and um, the evolution, the genetic evolution of pedagogy. And pedagogy has two sides. It has the learning side, which your experiments have been um, dealing with, but it also has the teaching side. And so if the pedagogy is different, um, you know, when you do the cross-fostering, it can be because the pedagogy on the teaching side was genetically selected for it. Therefore, I don't think it's worthwhile to do those experiments, even if you could do them. But this is my much simpler, less theoretical question um, coming from a developmental psychology um, uh, point, um, background point of view, which is, um, you know, the A not, as you know, the A not B error disappears with age in children. So I have two questions. One, how old the, um, the dogs and the wolves were, and two, whether it also disappears uh, that the ANAPR disappears with age in, in the dogs and the wolves, or the dogs. You no, know, I mean, these were, so yes, I forgot to uh, stress that. So the, the dogs and the wolves were sort of adult animals. So they were older than one year and a half, and that range, the dogs would sometimes even much older <laughs> the wolves as well. In the children, it, it disappears. And that also shows, actually, that this is what we have is a sort of a functional analogy. And it's not a full, uh, even not a homology, and so on. Because uh, maybe, actually, with the children, you could also have I mean, this is a very primitive setting. So you should, you might actually have similar effects uh, with uh, even in humans, 
when you are making the situation more complex. Actually, I can imagine that if you, uh, okay, anyway. So with the dogs, we, we think that they are not changing that. So they remain in that state of actually being receptive for human actions and the rules for not particularly being receptive for the same thing. But of course, that's another. So for the dogs, we see that um, also generally, if, if I'm talking to a dog owner uh, who, of course, asks us, uh, you know, how, what, how should I interact with my dog because he has never got a dog that I always say, okay, let's imagine that your dog is about a you know, one, two year old child and probably then should it work. But so in, in many aspects, in the function aspects, they are quite comparable. I mean, other dogs and dog and children of this age. So uh, that's what. But, but is there a change with the no, age? No, no, I mean, the, all dogs are making all the same errors. Yeah. Yes. So you could say that the children are developing it's sort of um, with age, but the dogs. Yes, are. yes. So they, of course, they, they, they have, they get the cognitive uh, uh, skills to actually then see also the other side or understanding the problem. Yes. Yes. If I understood, if I understood the dates correctly, it appears that the domestication occurred during the late Middle Paleolithic and near the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic. Now that was also uh, a time of great change in human tool use, human social organization. So I'm wondering, do you see any relationship between that? In other words, say, the development of compound tools, which seem to be roughly the time you're indicating, could indicate a shift in the nature of human pedagogy at that time as well. I, I'm, I'm just wondering. I, I'm not an expert <laughs> on, on that, really. I'm mean, especially not on the human aspect. But I think, uh, so, so, I think this this could be quite independent. So I, there are these claims that dogs had influenced human Evolution, I'm not really sure about that. Uh, so whether that was really this way, I think it's more, more like human have influenced dog evolution, and it's a domi more dominant uh, way of uh, influence. But um, of course, dealing with dogs, it's uh, easier if you are if you have the skills to make more complex uh, tools. But I don't think that dogs would, uh, especially dogs, are quite tool blind, so they don't right, interested right. in any tool. I mean, not really. Yes. Um, I have dog at my home, and uh, <laughs> it it seems clear to that uh, dog can make use of the uh, three aspects of the communicative cues. And uh, my question is, uh, do the dog use these cues uh, in dog dog interaction? Uh, no. But uh, first of all, we don't know. But um, what I can Im so so dogs don't really. Uh, there are two things. One is that most socialized dogs have a different social relationship with people and with, with other dogs. For dogs, are the human is more important if the dog is grown up in a human family and is dominantly uh, together with humans. The other aspect is that, of course, you can have families or groups where there are other dogs, and we don't really know actually too much about dog, dog, or wolf or interaction. So far, as far as I know, there have been nothing described very much similar to that in dogs or interspecifically in dogs. I can't really exclude that there might not be something similar between a cub and a, an adult animal. Probably not between adult animals, but maybe in a mother or father relationship uh, or even in a pack situation, dogs might actually, or wolves might sort of show some sort of teaching, but we don't really know about that. Oh, there's some, I don't know what, uh, maybe this, uh, going this way down and then from left to right, yes? I was just wondering why you didn't incorporate Tomasello, Carpenter, and uh, colleagues' model of, of, the, of joint attention and the kind of triadic communication with an object that has come out of, uh, I think he developed it before going to the Max Planck, but certainly at the yes, Max yes. And, and and so on, which seems a richer model for what you're trying to look at than the model that you've appropriated? Well, I mean, um, first of all, I mean, I wanted to focus on that because that could be the sort of idea of this pedagogy situation could be nicely making a parallel between why dogs might be having this ability. For the Thomas Sellers, I think it's more focused, it's as far as I know, I'm not very much an expert. That comes from more from a linguistic uh, tradition. So maybe, um, and this model is more uh, for a much earlier stage uh, useful. But I don't know. I don't think he's yeah. coming from a linguistic. Patricia, I don't know. 
Yeah, so. What, you would say, but I, he's, I mean, he would say this was a pre linguistic. Um, but it's very, yeah. I mean, I do agree with him because I, I think it is pre linguistic. He's trying to get at the foundations for language, and I think that this is focusing much more generally on pedagogy. Um, so it's not just about. I, I mean, they probably each would do, but I, it, it maybe would lead to slightly different experiments. I'm not sure there would be a huge difference in what you would do empirically if you use that. Maybe you could have a few more references in your talk, but apart from that. Yeah, you know, yeah so I mean. Especially in the United States, people are a lot more familiar um, you know, with Thomas Ello, and it maybe causes a little bit of pain to see him not cited at all. I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't think yeah. it would actually change anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, are we on, I was just curious whether or not anybody has started doing this kind of work with uh, tame foxes, the domesticated foxes, and whether or not they show similar um, differences or similar patterns of dogs with more focus on humans mm -hmm. than but I don't know. So I mean, of course, all these experiments that we are doing could be more or less repeated with those foxes, yeah. but uh, they are not available for us, so it has to be left to other people to, mm -hmm. to do. Yes? Um, I, I was just wondering if you had to control for any other, um, any other senses in dogs. So for example, if this is a ball that they had interacted mm -hmm. with previously, if then, you know, you're obviously dealing with sight, but then, you know, I'm just, I don't know anything about dogs other than my own, but he could find something underneath the sheet that I didn't even know was there, so just because yeah. he played with it before. Yes, I, we have lots of experiments showing that in that sort of uh, task, actually the visual stimulus is sort of overriding the olfactory one. So these are usually small rooms, there are smells everywhere, uh, so dogs are really working, I mean we know from other experiments, working uh, based on the, what they see. Of course, if you would give a dog the comment to find the ball, they would probably most of them would find them by the nose, but they are really watching in this case. Yeah. Yes? So yeah, also as a dog owner, I'm yeah. convinced that they, they do have special social learning skills. But I wonder in the, the A not B task, uh, someone could claim that uh, really the trick to, to solving the A not B task is keeping focused on that ball. And that really all that eye gaze is doing is distracting the dogs, right? And any other distractor could do the same thing. So rather than measuring sensitivity to pedagogy, you're just measuring susceptibility to distraction. Um, well, yes uh, and no. Um, so actually, we did some experiments where we have uh, we distract the dogs from the task, and then you can also find the same effect. So actually, if you use other distractions like sound, or I didn't have the time to show another experiments where you actually um, the human is making some noise with a, and without having an eye contact, and then you find a similar effect. So I think this eye contact is probably especially. It's not just a distracting stimulus, it's actually an engaging stimulus. But yes, so that would be one alternative explanation. We can't, of course, exclude it totally, but we think that we did some controls to include, exclude that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I want to go back to Patricia's point that children outgrow the A not B error mm -hmm. in her phrasing. I mean, another way of taking exactly the same result and putting a different interpretive frame on it is that dogs are more obedient than children, right? That is, that yeah, children are obedient mind. early on, and then um, you know, they become more independent, essentially, from their, from their potential teachers. There are many more sources of information around them that they can attend to, and um, people deceive them, and uh, as a consequence of the combination of those, they become um, more credulous, uh, more incredulous, rather, as learners in the pedagogical situation. But probably your typical dog in human history had uh, one or a very small number of owners, um, and his survival or her survival rested on learning from and being obedient to that individual. So it's not the case that, you know, I mean, you can say an adult dog performs like a small child and therefore, you know, is somehow inferior to a human by virtue of the fact that the dog never outgrows the error, or you can say there's been very strong selection on dogs to, you know, to uh, follow the pedagogical cues, learn the cultural rule for this particular individual, and adhere to it in the future. And children have, you know, uh, uh, have been selected in an environment where there are more sources of information and there are actors trying to deceive them. Probably very rarely in dogs' evolution has it been the case that their owners 
systematically deceive them in a way that would make them incredulous. Yep. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, the only problem with that explanation is I, I, mean, I, I just carried out that experiment for a class demo, and also I think you could see this in what we saw in the video, is there's no deception. You are actually showing them that you're moving it. It's called visible displacement, and when I did it... You misunderstood me, Patricia. That wasn't my point. Can I finish my point? Okay. So you're actually showing them when you move it from A to B. And so therefore, um, you, I mean, I found this, that 2008 article very surprising. I never knew about that, that, that it actually uh, functions as a distraction for the children, and they do better. But I, I don't think you can call it deception. I don't you understand You have misunderstood it. my point entirely. My point is that not that there is deception within the experiment. My point is that a child growing up faces peers, older children, many other individuals who will tell that learner things about the world that are not true. Okay? That means that culture acquisition machine in the kid's head can't be credulous all the time. Okay? The dog doesn't face the same adaptive challenge. Okay? It's not that the experiment involves deception. I agree with you that it doesn't. It's that the dog is not systematically manipulated by people who benefit by lying to it, and children are. And so as culture learners, children need to be less credulous than dogs do. And as a consequence, as they develop, they are. Actually, I, so so I, just, I I agree with that. So so basically, at the end, dogs children have to be have to be independent. So grown up, and they have to be able to value or, or judge what's being taught. For dogs, that's not really a question. They have to also be in the same setting, and probably there would be a selection. So if you, the dogs would sort of uh, get independently thinking about their work. People would not prefer having these dogs. So there might be a, yeah, yeah selection for that. Yeah. No, uh, yes, well, I don't know. Anyway, well, hey. This may be too bizarre, but has anyone ever considered looking at pedagogy from the perspective of the dog teaching the human? Because there's something about, they, it, it has to be going both ways. They can make us do anything. <laughs> well, uh, not really, but I mean, there are settings where you claim that, you know, if you get a dog, there you will change also your life and, and probably dogs. The question is really whether how much. Uh, so in the teaching is always, as far as I understand from an evolutionary point of view, you have to invest something as a teacher. I'm not sure whether dogs really invest in that. They behave and then we change our life, whether they do some sort of investment on that, that they are teaching us something. I would would be very smart and know how, when to give up, doing certain things that they do that they learn will get exactly what they want from us. But anyway, I've done yeah. this. But you know, you have this rat uh, seeing whether Skinner's rats and they, I conditioned the experimenter to give yeah. a food, you know, I mean, it's but right. that's <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> true that infants are, say, becoming less credulous as they're getting older, or potentially you're just using a slightly different learning strategy as they get older. It's maybe it's getting more complicated or something. Can you, so I guess getting away from the dogs a little bit, can you make the, the, the A not be a return by adding more trials, where like more learning trials before, by adding multiple models, by giving kids more information potentially? I think uh, you can put a kid in a situation where he will commit analog uh, errors, yes. But then the problem should be more complicated, I think. And if that was the question. So if, they, if you mean older children. Yeah, can yeah. You, can you make, you know, yeah I can, yes, time. yes, why, why not? It's just that uh, it, it has to be, you know, match some sort of, or not matching the understanding of the word. Because the idea is here that basically what you what the the skill here is, and is that was of maybe partly to the response what was why is not Thomas Sello here, which I'm sorry if if I didn't quote him, but the, it's also important in that model that actually uh, we or the the original was claimed that this model overcomes the problem of understanding the word, and I think that might not be stressed in th that model. So here is the, the, that the children has to learn, and dogs, of course, also they are facing the problems that that uh, either you understand it and then you can do it, or you are not understanding it. Now, when you are not understanding it, how we can transmit it still? So, and that's I think an important aspect. So. 
um, especially if I mean if you're doing a comp I mean if you have a problem that's my often happens to me you know problems of a computer somebody comes looks at my eyes looks at the computer does something pushes the button and I will do it forever because I'm not thinking you know and I'm not understanding the problem so I can do the same I not be here or even I will do it first try it out then I have another similar problem okay I let's try it what will happen probably nothing actually <laughs> so so that that there are some analog situations yeah kind of goes to the question about dogs teaching humans, uh, maybe not that far, but have you looked at uh, attempts on the part of dogs to establish communicative intent with humans to indicate something in the environment? Right? I mean, glassy, telling the owner that there's a fire or, or maybe pointer species or something like that? <laughs> yeah, it's very, that's a very sensitive question because uh, Yes and no. So actually, you know, um, you have to understand the so normal social situation between a person or the owner and the dog. And in most cases, in, in practice, today's dogs have uh, learned that uh, the human is initiating an action and then that's your they turn. Uh, lots of actually dog, this is how they are trained, this is all in training books on dogs and so on. The human has to let's say, uh, control the dog. In, if I wouldn't say dominant, but at least control. So in that situation, if you get dogs and humans like that, it's very difficult to design any observation where the dog and now, okay, feels that now he can act on his own. So all this, what you get in the news that the dog is rescued, the family from the fi uh, you know, house on fire and all that, I mean to do experiments that actually particularly look at that, I don't want to put uh, houses on fire first of all, but, but even in other situations, it's very difficult because the dog is very, so we have lots of trials, but the, immediately the dog senses that now he, ha he may, he, he, there is some expectancy that he should do something. A lot of dogs just, you know, just sort of collapsing. So it would need uh, another upbringing, I think, for dogs, and then you could, because they, are, they have the capacity. So it's clear that with some dogs you see it, but to do a good study, uh, it's very difficult. But it's a good idea, yes. So it would be nice to have uh, that sort of data. Yes? Well, uh, just, just um, going off that, maybe not rescuing this fam a family from a, from a burning house, because um, that would really need yeah. a billionaire. But um, I think that um, I, I think in, that Chuck has a video with his own dogs where he gives one of the dogs food and doesn't give the other one food, and, and then the dog is scratching at the bowl and looking at him and scratching at the bowl and looking at him like, where's mine? Yeah. So it's still an interaction, but not as I mean, yeah, I have a video also that, I mean, the story that we tried out, for example, that in one family, the the it was forbidden i mean it is forbidden to eat in the in the bed for example and then the children are eating in the bed and the dog is then uh, noticing that and not running into the kitchen and alerting the mother you know that something is going on <laughs> and barking so I mean, you can have these sort of stories and uh, but i mean it's uh, you can't have a study population <laughs> on that this is not easy yes yes Yes. Uh, well, yes. Yes. So, so that that is quite quite uh, difficult to study. So, one experiment what we did, and that was also, uh, I mean, it's a very simple way of doing that. That if you hide, and you can also do it uh, um, uh, yourself, hide some food for the dog that is important for the dog, and then it will let lead the human to that uh, situation. So, that sort of interactions are are possible, but. Uh, so uh, doing, especially if there's um, lots of emotions involved and you rely on um, motivation in that, that uh, direction, laboratory experiment, that sort of, even if it's not very clear, laboratory experiments are very difficult to design. So uh, especially even that the dog should, I mean, we tried many things uh, with dogs, they want to go out and they want to catch, chase the cat or whatever, even that doesn't really work in a, in a very pure, on command. So that is always a problem with that, that aspect. 
Yes. Yeah. Did you say something about the difference between dogs and other animals that have been domesticated for a very long time, like cats, for example? Yes. Yeah, so, about the differences in their abilities and. Well, it, it, uh, yeah, so, so um, I mean, first of all, they're not much known about cats, I mean, scientifically, apart from the stories and anecdotal information. Um, what you might uh, expect is that lots of these uh, skills are uh, different in cats and dogs, at least quantitatively. So if you would do a, uh, that sort of A not B error with a cat experiment, probably cats would not be so much engaging, so they might not commit to error, more like wolves. But again, there's a big variation in the cats, uh, actually among wolves, uh, dogs as well. So it might depend very much on, on, on the cat and on the breed or, or whatever. So uh, the problem is with all these comparisons that uh, there are so many differences. So the experience, actually the, the, the evolutionary, so we could we did something with horses together, I mean, parallel experiments on horses, uh, communicative interactions. Then you get some similarities, but again, the horse's visual system is quite different. What he can see with the eyes put on the side and so on. So there are so many factors. I mean, you know, Bob is not anymore here, but I mean, even if you have problems with the dog-wolf differences, how you can show it, then any sort of special claims, apart from saying that, you know, a horse may be performing such and this and this, uh, well, that is different. So with horses, actually work quite hard to actually find out that this very simple uh, pointing experiment where you point for one thing should at least work. But then you end up in a totally different setup uh, with the horse. And, and then, of course, whether it, so it, it's, it's very complicated to do all these comparative experiments, especially if you think about chimpanzee and humans. There are all so many differences, and uh, it's very difficult to account for what is the particular effect. Yes. Yes. I just want to, to throw out an idea that might help address Christina's uh, question. You did the same A not B experiment, but had all the humans leave the room before the dog was let off the leash. Uh, you might be able to get some traction on whether it's just trying to appease the humans in the room or if it's actually getting social information from them. Uh, now, we haven't done this version, uh, yes, but uh, yeah, so yes, I'm just thinking about, we had a similar experiment, uh, but that was another, so we did something where we changed the uh, humans, so the first, uh, I just have to think about the result, so the A trials were din done by one human and then the B by another one, but I don't remember what was the result now, but uh, I, I think uh, the dogs would, uh, still com do the commit to error. So it was not about to say the, but if you're changing, for example, uh, the, yes, I'm not sure about, okay, I have to check that. But anyway, yes, so that's that sort of ways you could control for this effect. Yeah, yeah. yes. It's a clever yeah. suggestion, but the problem is that, uh, I mean, dogs know that people come back. Uh, you know, uh, my dogs don't get up on the couch until they heard the car leave the driveway. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're very well yeah. behaved when there's a possibility that they'll be caught misbehaving, right? Yeah. So um, it needs to be something much more elaborate than that. It's not impossible. Mm -hmm. it needs to be more yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so presumably for most um, non-domesticated animals, it's very difficult for an animal to learn to be submissive to an individual that's not a member of their species. Mm -hmm. um, and you expect yeah. that would not happen very often. And so um, it seems plausible that part of the selection on dogs has been selection to basically treat humans as a member of their social group. Yes, that's um, probably, yes. Yeah, so I wonder, and I mean, wolves are reported to hunt cooperatively. Um, there's some suggestion that they communicate with each other about uh, prey and things like that. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. how could you test uh, a, is there any plausibility to the idea that you take a wolf and then you select for the ability to become submissive to a, a human being and, and that alone gets you the abilities that you're... So, so actually, that's what is also very important here that we don't really claim that if there would be any genetic difference or selective uh, um, way that these are very complicated abilities. So first of all, I think the eye contact, which is already makes a big difference, that could be probably selected for very rapidly even and and somebody mentioned the domain the the selected foxes so that was part we don't really know actually because there are very few data still out but some of the data suggest that a relatively simple selection procedure can 
make big changes in, in the overall behavior pattern. So we don't know whether these uh, selected foxes have a longer eye contact with member each of each, with either with, with that, without within the species or, or within this um, group or with humans, but that sort of things. And and I think that all that what we see here is there's nothing complex in it. That's why I think it's uh, appealing for for other explanations that you don't really need big changes in order to arrive at a relatively com uh, complex uh, behavior or solution. Yes. Yeah. Actually, with just one sense that I think that with the wolves, this cooperation is always debated, actually also from wolf researchers. So how complex is this collaboration between wolves when they actually hunt? I'm not a wolf person, but they are very you know, distinct opinion about whether it's a very complicated issue or whether they're just running and then, you know, who gets there first, you know, I know that issue, so I'm not sure. Yep. So, I, I mean, one way of addressing this uh, is with conspecifics as instructors or models, and my understanding was that the uh, Gurgain Chibra style um, over imitation experiment mm -hmm. had been done with dogs using either pulling the lever with your paw yes, or yes, your yes. mouth. And that wolves don't over imitate from wolves the way from dogs at least the way the dogs over imitate from dogs. Now dogs, there there is a species difference there, but still you would expect that a wolf would learn from a dog if the if the principal barrier was um, uh, was humans are real different than wolves. Am I am I correct? About I'm not that? sure about that. They did this with the wolves. I just know the wolf the dog part, but they might not did the wolf imitation. Oh, maybe I'm reading yeah. into the experiment what I want. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the dog experiment exists with the selective uh, selective imitation, whatever, but they uh, didn't have the wolf as a subject there. Oh, okay. they, they will do it for sure in a few years, but you have to grow them up a bit. Yeah. Yes? When you did the AMA, the experiment with the wolves, you used adult wolves? Yes. They were mm -hmm. same, relatively the same age as the dogs because, yes. I mean, I'm just curious whether the wolves' development is really different from the dogs and that Maybe young, you know, young wolves would be more receptive, but then as they age, they stop just like humans. <coughs> uh, yes, so actually for, we don't have any evidence for wolf puppies, uh, I mean, or younger wolves in, in this. The dogs, uh, actually, they, they are quite fine with the ab not be error. Uh, actually, also when as a puppy or a younger animals. So if there are no humans there, they are doing well, and so the wolves should do those the same. But I mean, we, we do we need some experiments. The problem is we don't have wolf puppies or access to wolf puppies at the moment, so it's not just so easy that to get them. But but on the other hand, with the ages, so the older adult animals and wolves developing actually slower in uh, especially in the later stages. So that means that if you have a you need, would need, I mean, two or one and a half and two-year-old uh, dogs could be comparable to one one-year-old wolf, more or less. But, I mean, you know, that's not very strictly elaborated, so it's difficult to say exactly. Yes? Uh, so far, your presentation and the questions and your answers and the uh, discourse here has been at the cognitive level. Uh, with the exception of uh, one question that uh, bordered at least on the affective, on the emotional level. The question I would have is this. Um, when you take a puppy, whether it be a dog or a wolf, but especially, let's say, a dog, and raise it exclusively with one human being and not subject it, to the learning that comes from being raised uh, among other conspecifics. Are you in some way uh, creating something artificial, um, some, some kind of, um, of um, false uh, uh, animal that um, re responds mainly on an emotional level, in other words, the need to be loved by, by the human being, to be cared for, to be fed, vetted, and so on and so forth. The only question I have that would be an exception to it is that you talk about eye contact, which I understand is a very important part of um, 
the exercise or the um, behaviors of animals in dominant uh, hierarchies. So then my question is, does that particular um, pedagogical effect that occurs with human beings, a, um, a purely um, instructional pedagogical in that sense matter, or to what extent is it a matter of uh, uh, affectional ties? Um, I'll just mm -hmm. say one other thing. Yeah. Uh, I, um, and this speaks somewhat of Dan's mentioning of, um, of um, deception. Uh, some years ago, my wife and I were on a uh, recreational trip uh, down under. Uh, we were in Australia, Tasmania, and New Zealand. And one of the most remarkable things we saw, and this was a demonstration for tourists, <coughs> was how a shepherd got his flock to move in various directions just by blowing short whistle blows uh, and so that his his dog was up on the side of the hill if he blew the whistle twice the dog would move the um, the flock to our right if he blew it once the dog would move it to our left and then some combination of long and short blows brought the back of the uh, dog skittering back to us, jumped on a uh, hood of a jeep and uh, gave me a big wet kiss. And uh, it, it uh, I wondered, uh, in another demonstration, we were up closer to the flock and the dog. And in order to uh, move the sheep in the opposite direction from the way they were tending. Dog would run over the backs of the sheep, get in front of them, and then get into a um, menacing pose. Now, that's deception. He, he wasn't going to attack them because as I, he or she wouldn't attack them because I understand that they're raised to a large extent with sheep. Uh, in those countries. So isn't that a kind of deception? And how do they learn that? Well, I mean, I, I'm not a sheepdog trainer, so I know a few tricks, uh, but but that's not really my, my field. Whether it's deception or not, that's another issue. I mean, and who is deceiving whom? But actually, the, the these dogs were probably also bred for expressing this behavior that is perceived by the sheep as a predatory behavior and respond to that uh, quite well. Actually, you can't really exclude that when, I mean, there are also Hungarian uh, sheep, dogs, sheep dogs, and they also bark, so they give noise, so there's a lot of feedback between the sheep and the, and the dog, and dogs might actually not really attack them, so they're not bite them, but they really go near and really try to uh, sort of support this, uh, this vision by also behaviorally. So I think um, that that is also another issue. The other, I mean, it's always uh, so. So big back to what you you started uh, to mention at the beginning. So I think uh, it's very difficult to exclude anything which is uh, what you would describe as emotion in dogs when you have this eye contact. Actually, there is now a recent recent paper. It really needs to be replicated, but uh, Japanese researchers show that. When the human is in an eye contact with a dog or even a tactile contact, then they get a mutual increase in, in oxytocin and so on, which means also that it's not just about communication, it's also an emotional contact. And actually one what the big change is, uh, is also in, uh, the, in human evolution and probably in dog evolution is the use of eye contact. So it's not just this uh, a pr a first uh, level of uh, aggressive or dominant submissive uh, uh, communication, but actually it's a, a way of communicating mutual interest, collaboration, transfer of information, whatever. And I think this is the change that took place uh, also in a hominin uh, line and probably is sort of replicated in the case of dogs and wolves. And dogs can really learn that 
especially if you start very early. Uh, I mean, if the human influence is close, so you can you do it with a puppy and, and so on. So, but, and probably it's parallel with some emotional component through the special brain structures, which are also there in the dog, and we don't really know anything about that, but I could assume that this has also an important role. So somebody was saying here about the dog is pleasing the human. I mean, uh, again, this is easy to express this word pleasing, but if you think about it as a biological mechanism, I mean, either you say it's a submissive thing, which is then again, you can easy to explain by, but if it's not, then what it is, if you, so, it's only if you have some sort of emotional sensitivity and then try to synchronize the emotions, your emotions with the human emotion somehow. And I think dogs have this ability, but measuring emotion is, uh, yeah, not, not so easy for <laughs> okay, us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.